Hi, this is Sean Halter, host of the CMO Suite Podcast, letting you know that as we kick off season four, several of these episodes were recorded in New York City just prior to the COVID outbreak. At the end of this episode, stick around for a follow-up as to how our guest is making their way through today's current marketing environment and what they see as the next opportunity. And as always, don't forget to subscribe and catch up on all the previous episodes at www.thecmosuite.com. This episode of the CMO Suite is brought to you by Uconnex. Uconnex provides digital solutions and teams to brand CMOs, VPs, and marketers looking for true transparency in the biddable media space. From paid social and PPC to complex platforms like the Trade Desk, brands from across the world have connected to Uconnex. Visit them today at Uconnex.com and No Kid Hungry. We're proud to promote No Kid Hungry and their many initiatives to help kids in need of meals. Visit them at NoKidHungry.org. This episode of the CMO Suite is also brought to you by Winmo. Winmo is the most comprehensive and widely used advertising database, providing an unfair advantage to media and marketing professionals nationwide. Winmo tracks every national advertiser, their agency relationships, and key executives within each organization. Get instant media spend, competitor tracking, and industry trend analysis in one easy-to-use application that integrates with all major CRM platforms. CMO Suite listeners receive complimentary trials of Winmo just by visiting winmo.com backslash CMO Suite. Finally, the CMO Suite is presented by the CMOCouncil.org as their official marketers podcast. The Chief Marketing Officer Council is the only global network of executives specifically dedicated to high-level knowledge exchange, thought leadership, and personal relationship building among senior corporate marketing leaders and brand decision makers. The CMO Council's 15,000 plus members control more than $550 billion dollars aggregated annual marketing expenditures, and run complex distributed marketing and sales operations worldwide. For more information on membership, visit the CMOCouncil.org. Let's start the show. You're in the CMO Suite, the podcast for marketers who want to be in the know, presented by Connectivity Holdings. Hello and welcome to the CMO Suite Season 4. It is your host, Sean Halter. As always, the CMO Suite is brought to you by Connectivity Holdings. I'm excited to have our co-host uh, with us as we record here in New York City. It's Stacey Horton. Hi, Stacey. Welcome back. Thank you. Hi, Sean Holter. Season four is here. And uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about with season four is we have a handful of some guests that we've been trying to get on for the last few seasons who have either said no or their schedules wouldn't work or they were like, who in the world are you? Why and why are you bothering us and our (laughs) publicity department? Uh, And one of those who said yes, who I'm ridiculously excited to have is our guest as we kick off the season. It is Tariq Hassan, the chief marketing officer for Petco. Tariq, welcome to the show. Nice to meet you guys. So thanks. Uh, you made it over here this morning. Uh, you had the joy that is New York City. You had the, the fun of the cab ride over. How was that? Well, you know, I took an Uber ride. They got, got an Uber driver. He thought he was a New York cab driver. There you go. <laughs> and, and he worked his best. Listen, the most important thing is, d- do you have pets? I mean, you're the CMO for Petco. Do, do you have pets at home? Absolutely. We have a fine, young, uh, nearly eight month um, medium Labradoodle. Oh, we have golden doodles. Mm, yeah. The Labradoodles are amazing. Is that, uh, so family pet, you got a nice dog. Did you have pets growing up? I had fish. You had fish? I did not have a, like, you know, the cat dog. Well, they count. And I had a lizard at Mm. one point. Fish and a lizard. Where did you grow up? Did you grow up here in the city? No, I actually grew up in Canada. I grew up in London, Ontario, Canada. Ooh, Ontario. How was that? Well, it's the Great White North. It is the Great White North. Kinder, gentler country. Kinder (laughs) kinder and gentler. Did your, uh, what did your parents do when you, when you grew up in uh, Canada? I, had, I grew up with a hardworking father who was an engineer and a mom who worked up at the university and continuing education for, in the dental industry. Brothers and sisters at Two all? Two older brothers. I am uh, uh, Are you oop, the baby the of the baby family? I refer to. Listen. My mom says I'm the only one playing, but I'm pretty sure uh, 50 years later she'd <laughs> agree I was a pretty big oops. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I was one of those as well. I have two older sisters and then suddenly a son kind of comes along. But yeah, they, yeah. listen, it, it's, a, it's all part of the history of it. What brought you here? To the States, did your family move here or did you decide to come here for school? I'm actually a dual citizen. I was born in Ohio and raised in Canada. What and, part of Ohio? Uh, Toledo, Ohio. I'm from Cincinnati. Mm. Wow. Ohio. Ohio boys. That is, that's yeah. almost the great, the great white north of uh, the U.S. <laughs> Not a lot to do there. Uh, where'd you go to school? I went did my undergrad work at University of Western Ontario. And then uh, when I graduated, the Canadian economy was not kinder, gentler. So I came down to the States to go to grad school, Northwestern, and, and stayed. How did you like Northwestern and what did you major in when you were there? Oh, what's not to like about Chicago? Like Northwestern. <laughs> it's cold. Um, you know, everyone talks about how cold it is, but I think we find a way to have a lot of fun and, and get True. past it. It's a great city. It um, is a good city. You know? I, I, took my, uh, I did my master's in, in business and uh, integrated marketing communications. So that the, my dad lived in Chicago. I would go and stay summers there. And my sister, who sometimes listens to the show, I used to, because I thought it was just a, such a cool city, I started telling people that's where I was from. And my sister would always be the one to remind me, 
Um, you're not from Chicago. You're from Cincinnati. Yeah. You live in Chicago in the summers. That's it. Stop saying you're from there. But oh, just such such an amazing city. Would would move back if it. I don't know. The weather is a little crazy there. So yeah, but I still say it's the most livable big city in America. I don't disagree it, with it you. It is a great city. I miss it. Everything's there. Everything's yeah. Everything's there for just that. I have my daughter there, so it feels like it's still you know very much part of home. You finish school, and then is your first well, kind of one of your first gigs outside of school at the agency side, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, I started it? in the agency world uh, initially in Detroit, working in the automotive world, um, mostly on GM brands. Uh, and that same experience is what actually took me overseas for the first time. I, I was over in uh, Dubai for a few years before wow. people were talking about where Dubai was, working on General Motors business. Was there anything really there at the you could time? See the beginning of it, it was. Uh, you could definitely see it as an emerging city the, of what it is today, um, but certainly not the the state that people know of it today. Uh, and then you ended up at HP for a bit. I came back and I was in Chicago for a number of years, working in the agency world, a couple of stops at a, a couple of agencies, and was a part of a founding group that uh, started an agency called Element 79 post uh, the acquisition of uh, Quaker by PepsiCo. Uh, and that's uh, that experience actually created a number of deep relationships. One of those relationships is the uh, one that invited me over to come and join him over at HP, who I actually currently work for today as my current boss, Ron Coughlin. Isn't it amazing? We were talking about that um, uh, with another guest. We, I, I feel like we talk about that with guests a lot. That relationship piece is still so critical. I it's mean, everything. it is everything. How do you keep them? Well, I think, you know, look at my first thing you do is you value them. Um, and for me, I've had a number of uh, really, really deep relationships across my professional career that have both served incredibly well professionally, but as, as often as the case, you develop those relationships, they also tend to serve you well in mentorship personally as well. And you feel like really that way to, th- at least I feel like, and, and, and maybe you've got an opinion on as well, the way that you show value back to that again is you're there for them, whether there's anything they can do to help you or, or not help you, and you're just you're just there. Whatever you need, how do I help? Yeah, most of those relationships, like all of our relationships in life, uh, the definition of how you first met over time starts to fade, and it's the dimensions of those relationships of how you support each other. Uh, quite often, not in the times that are around the business that actually add up to meaning the most. And and that, for me personally, that's that's the beauty of our industry. It's one of the things I think, uh, you know, we joke around a lot about how small the marketing industry is, but that's actually one of the upsides of that end, of the part of our industry is there's a lot of folks that are there to support you, uh, both as a professional and, and in between. And I feel like those that are there, again, maybe perhaps to support you, uh, are those who are there over time who've just decided this is it. This is the industry I'm in. I'm going to st- stick through it. Uh, especially in New York, it's a, it's a very tight-knit, small group. You know, uh, LinkedIn is an interesting platform out there where you can kind of see what a connection is to certain people. But uh, what we found interesting over four seasons of this show is I think once we once we started to do the show and people realized it's not a sales pitch, it's a chance for them to kind of talk about their journey and for us to share information and knowledge. uh, We get referrals in a lot of cases, and it's surprising how small that group can be sometimes of uh, especially traveling through whether it's a Unilever where 20 people all came through there to some extent or an HP where the same thing where these kind of collection of people come through. Do you think there's something to be said for maybe some of these brands where people tend to kind of come through, but there's so many things you can learn from there that it almost sets you up to be in perhaps an even greater position or as a CMO of another brand because you kind of all cut your teeth in the same place. And it's that, that fiber that keeps you kind of held together. Yeah. I think at one point, uh, and I think it's evolved a little bit. I think the interrelationship between, you know, certain categories were sort of the pedigree for development. I think that's shifted a little bit, particularly in the, in the digital era. But I think, oddly enough, that shift in the digital has actually created a, an even greater camaraderie of sharing and connectivity because all of us live sort of across a different range of the, the data spectrum and the technology spectrum. And so the it's created sort of a bigger open learning uh, classroom, if you will. And I think the needs and the relationships in some ways are even more uh, substantial and important today. Who do you feel like that's part of that connection group for you that you that you still lean on a bit from time to time, where you're you're either just stuck with something or you you, you need a uh, a voice of reason that you trust to to tell you you're either doing this right or you're doing this wrong, and 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 you take that advice. Yeah, I think there's a you know, for me it's a, it's a pretty broad cross section of, of of folks that I connect in with, and it's it's very seldom uh, driven by category, and it's very seldom driven by you know sort of the duration of the relationship. It's quite often you know, looking for those folks who have unique experiences uh, that are either, you know, complementary or different in mind that can support me. And they're, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty eclectic. They, you know, they range from a, you know, people like Nick Drake, who I, who I connect with, 
uh, there's some number of folks. Antonio Lucio has been a long time mentor for me, but they, and then I would argue with, with Antonio, he's a perfect example of someone who's been a really long term personal mentor as much as a professional mentor. Uh, Stephen Wolf Pereira, uh, an, another uh, meaningful connection. So there's a number of folks across uh, across the network, but you know I think they change and they develop and they morph. And, and I think one of the things that when I moved into my most recent role that I think was a really pleasant surprise was the number of the relationships that were created with people I didn't even know. People who had reached out, other CMOs who reached out and said, you know, you're about to go on this journey, uh, see the transformation you're talking about. Here are some of the things I've learned, and if I can help, let me know. And, and that's been a really uh, both, uh, I guess, somewhat surprising, but m more so rewarding uh, in terms of how that's played out. Do you think some of that is also as we age a bit, we realize we're not maybe as smart as we always thought that we were and that there is, I don't want to say a finality to this, but there's a seasonality that w there's some seasoning we bring to the table as we get a little bit older. And some of that seasoning is realizing there's still a lot, maybe a lot to learn out there in the space and, um, and, and, and just trying to find maybe some of the excitement in the space. To yeah, I'd like to, I like to think that we all get to a place where we're a little more comfortable with our bumps and bruises and, and having them pointed out. Um, I think it's a really important part of development. Uh, and for me personally, one of the things that I think is absolutely critical, uh, both as a leader, uh, as well as those I'm connected with, is, you know, I think one of the areas that's really important to me is how can we start to bring some of that openness and vulnerability uh, to the marketplace? I think that is a relatively new dimension to, to things that we're starting to see, the ability to sort of acknowledge not only the things you're talking about in terms of maybe things we aren't as smart on um, and then we need to learn about, but I think also the open vulnerability of some of those things uh, are becoming really important critical characteristics of things we reflect as leaders. Do you think that's also maybe an extension of how advertising, specifically advertising, and and to a, to a lesser extent or to a different extent, marketing has changed in this era of content where it's less about selling, which is selling, and more about creating some kind of authentic nature to either yourself or your brand and realizing, again, we're not perfect. There's bumps and bruises all over the place. We're trying to get better every day. Um, I feel like because perhaps of social media or just because of, of the nature of it, every brand goes through bumps and bruises and now it's even more at the forefront and those that seem to be more open and honest about, hey, we're, we're trying to adapt or we're trying to change feels more authentic? Do you think that plays any nature in this? Yeah, I will tell you, I, I don't know that I would say that's more today than previously. Um, if you look back and think about some of the great legacy brands that are still doing it, you know, the Nikes of the world, I had the pleasure of working on Gatorade uh, for almost 10 years. Uh, if you think about what Dove initially did, I mean, those were all pre really digital and social content eras. Agreed. I think we've just ended up with more channels to be able to do with it. And I think the bigger difference is the customer engagement. And, you know, our consumers can now respond back to us and call us out That's when true. we're maybe not so much. So, and so I think the requirement is more critical. Um, I think what we're seeing uh, very directly is something that's always been present, which is purpose matters, authenticity matters. Um, but you get called out for it if you're not really on your game before you could maybe, you know, settle into settle it. In, yeah. Let's talk about your time at Petco. So you've been there for uh, just a little under two years. Yeah. What to you has been one of those things that was most surprising as you've kind of settled into it? Like either I didn't know that the brand could do this or would do this, or what's been one of those kind of aha moments for you uh, over at Petco? I think for me, probably the biggest aha moment was just, and it's actually a reinforcement for the physicality of, of brick and mortar retail. Uh, the biggest aha moment for me is our people and just how incredibly powerful and what the magic sauce to our business is is our, our 15,000 partners in these stores who literally get up every single day to try and improve the quality of some pet's life in a different way, uh, whether it's four-legged fur or whether it's whether it's literally the aquatic side of the, uh, you know, the reptile side of the business. These folks are fully engaged and they're fully committed to a, to a deep purpose that frankly extends beyond even our, biz, our business and our brand. Um, I don't know what that, what that should have surprised me, but I think the extent in which and the depth in which these folks are prepared to go uh, is tremendous and and you never see it more than in times of change or crisis um, and certainly uh, we've gone through elements of tornadoes and earthquakes and you know some pretty devastating uh, situations where you will face damage in stores etc and and you know these folks get up every day to figure out how to how to be there for, for all these pet parents. And that's been a pretty tremendous, amazing, powerful surprise. Well, and the term pet parent is certainly uh, one that anybody who has pets kn knows that part of it. You end up sometimes treating your pets even better than maybe you treated your kids somewhere along the way, right? Because they're very vulnerable, but you love them. And I, as I look at uh, Petco or just pets in general, it seems, again, back to that point, the way marketing has changed, the opportunity to be able to talk to people about 
um, the impact the pets have in their lives, whether it's through crisis or whether it's through love or whether, or, you know, whether it's through those, it does open up different opportunities. Certainly social media plays a huge role uh, in that. Where do you feel like social uh, is fitting into Petco today? And, and where do you feel like you see that evolving over the next you know couple of years, if we can jump into a, a specific uh, channel function? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the beauty of our category, um, this wasn't a surprise, but I think the depth of it um, is, is pretty emotive. You know, we're dealing with true lives here. And so you joke around about the care factor, but it it is, you know, it really is of that dimension. This is the equivalent of, you know, four-legged infants um, that don't grow up, that never actually have the ability to speak. And and the deep relationships that we have uh, with our pets are, are, and frankly, just increasing relationship is pretty powerful. So that inherently, in some ways, the canvas is a little bit easier because it lends itself to some pretty tremendous stories. Um, you know, all you have to do is look at Facebook, Instagram, look at your favorite feed, you know, doesn't take very long to see how quickly you'll see a post on this pet, that pet. And it's the equivalent of, of you know, flashing baby pictures and baby stories. I've always wondered, I don't know, I, I, Lisa knows this. Sometimes I'll come up with an idea that I'm like, why doesn't somebody build this? And then, you know, a year later, somebody has it. I don't know why there isn't a social, maybe because Instagram serves that purpose, but I don't know why there isn't a social media platform that is just, just for us and our pets. Cause it does seem like we post so much about our pets. And if you love pets, you almost don't want all the rest of the stuff inundating you to some extent. I don't know. Is that, are you and I going to go into business with that Tariq next? Is well, you know, it's on? interesting. We, we, oh, here he goes. We actually, here he goes. We, well, we actually, oh. you know, we actually, we actually, yeah. had, we had a platform at one point Did that you? was, that was truly just a, it was sort of Insta, you know, Insta, Insta- pup, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and actually it, it doesn't play out as much as you'd think. People hmm. want to be part of a broader community, just like you as a parent, you know, aren't looking to only live in an environment where you're just on with parents and kids. It, yeah. it, the same sort of desire to have that sort of reflection of all parts of your life show right, up well, in the I same thought, with Listen, kids. I thought I had the million dollar idea. Well, the, you, the place you, you, you do have it is, the place you do have it is there's certainly aspects of socialization. And so you are seeing elements of, you know, either unique parks, private parks popping up, um, uh, you know, dog parks where you can show Our up. Our hotel has this amazing dog park. Yeah. Uh, where are we? Soho Grand? Soho Grand in New York City has this amazing... We saw this park. We're like, oh my God, this park is awesome. We want to hang out there. They're like, it's just for dogs. Yeah. Really? And then there's, you know, then there's, there's, that are blending where, you know, you'll have, you know, brew pubs, micro brews connecting with private, you know, dog parks and giving you the opportunity to come together with other pet parents. Where does a social platform like um, We Rate Dogs, where, where do, where do influencers like that uh, come into play with kind of your long-term strategy of, of incorporating influencers into... Uh, into the Petco brand. We use a tremendous number of both micro and, uh, you know, macro influencers. Um, they play at critical times for us in particular around seasonal areas. So we were using them uh, uh, pretty extensively during the holidays. Um, new product launches, uh, certainly our, our partners in store that carry a number of products uh, will leverage them. And then we, you know, obviously will elevate some of those things as well. It plays a tremendous role for us in the aspects of health and wellness in particular. Uh, you'll start to see us continuing that journey in a much more aggressive way. Last year, we started it by pulling out of our stores all, all dog food and cat food and snacks that had artificial preservatives uh, in them. And and that was our first step to really starting to move towards being a company that's really, truly focused around being a health and wellness company as opposed to a pet retailer. So the importance of whether it's physicians or other influencers, they're very critical for us as we move forward. Talk to us a little bit about your marketing team. Again, everybody knows the brand. It's it's always interesting to me sometimes. You talk to a brand that you think might be small and they have this this massive team because you don't realize there's a whole business to business angle or whatever that aspect is. And then sometimes you'll talk to a large brand and you realize, man, they are running they are running on, you know, on a pretty small team. So talk to us a little bit about your team. What's the size of the team that you have and, and what are some areas that you feel like they're really focused on right now? Yeah, we, we run somewhere, probably somewhere in the middle, but it's because of the scale of some of the things we do in house as well. My team's just south of probably 200 folks. Um, but we also have a creative studio in house that draws a ton of uh, production, uh, for both social and for, uh, our own channel networks, uh, and as well as our internal communications programming. But, you know, uh, it's an organization that extends everything from supporting our in-store capabilities, uh, to our external consumer elements. So it's, you know, media group, uh, insights and analytics group, which an analytics group is probably the uh, analytics and CRM and loyalty are probably the biggest areas where we're growing and adding the most uh, support into the organization as we continue to drive and understand the relationship with our, with our customer. That what I would say would be the other major surprise that I found when I joined the organization, 85% of all of our transactions take place on a rewards card. Mm -hmm. And so that gave us a direct signal to truly starting Mm -hmm. to understand who these parents were and the relationships they had with their with their pet. And that was actually part of my, my initial intrigue in joining the organization was that we had this incredible signal around understanding these, these animals. And 
we also had services. So we have, you know, we're, we're expanding vets. You'll see the largest expansion of vets in the store over the next two to three years. We have groomers, we have training, and then we have our retail elements. So our ability to really get to a 360 relationship with that pet and then help you as a parent manage that relationship. What's amazing about really that, unique. I saw a sign, a sort of an A sign frame outside of the Petco I shop at near uh, Flatiron. And it's really a way for other pet parents to get to know each other as well. Yeah. And it's this interactive, oh, who's going to be featured, this veterinarian, who's able to then cross-promote his offices yeah. around the corner. And it's just a great way for the community to come together as yeah. well. And yeah, and training acts very much the same way. You're bringing, you know, quite often group training together. And uh, my, my own pup has gone through our pup training school. at yeah, yeah, Union Square, uh, which is just a phenomenal store. And, uh, you know, you're in there with three or other four other families that are on the same journey as you. And, and it's not that indifferent than, you know, you know, you know, baby development. And what you went through as a parent. Say, yeah, yeah. You, you start them at that, at that stage yeah. and you're a, you're a, a Petco family for life to yeah. some extent. Talk to us uh, as we've got a few more minutes here, if you don't mind, talk to us a little bit about insourcing and outsourcing, which again, seems to be very top of mind right now. You've got a, a team that's f- you know focused on a lot of your main and core areas. What do you guys still look for outside and and how does that process work for you guys? Yeah, I, I'm a believer in, in, you know, both in terms of who we develop internally in our organization, coming from pretty broad and, uh, you know, eclectic backgrounds, keeping our creativity internally, uh, you know, free, fresh as well, but also externally, I think those ideas, you, you do benefit from working with the right agency partners who are working in other categories, who see other you know, other segments and, and bring that kind of refreshment. So we actually work with uh, a handful of other agencies. We work with a PR partner. We work with a, a media partner. And yeah, we do work with a, a mainline agency partner. It is sometimes nice, again, to your point, just to have obviously services in-house. You can you can work at speed, uh, but sometimes when you're working with some outside groups, again, it just gives you a different perspective or maybe they're seeing- or Different they're, perspective. They're, yeah. And I think increasingly the importance is, is I don't you know, really like the notion of in-house and, and sort of supplier service mindset. It, we really work hard to try and bring these together into a collaborative. In fact, even, even referencing our agency partners as the co, um, as the collaborative. Mm-hmm. Um, and we try to function as a central organization. It's not, it's easier on some days than others, but, sure. but I think, um, while it's important to have those fresh ideas from different places, it's also critically important that you then figure out a way to aggregate those in such a way that everyone is living and breathing this in the tent of the brand and, and not, you know, for their own purposes. What do you wish you knew more about in this space? What What's that area where, again, if you had nothing but time to be able to really dig in and understand something that you're that you're still wrapping your head around, what, what would that be for you? Well, I, I don't know if I would say it's wrapping my head around. I feel like it's, it's I wish I could keep up with all of it, <laughs> um, yeah. which is the, the critical role that, that both performance media and, and digital uh, play in our business. And, 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 and frankly, even the phrase performance media, I, I'm re- going to start referring to it as branded performance media because we get into this silly conversation about brand versus performance. And my answer is yes. Um, you know, your, your brand better perform and your performance better actually reinforce your brand. But I think that the environment and the speed at which we're working with data and the ability to customize, uh, I think the customization piece is one that we're moving really rapidly to try and understand, particularly as we move more and more to not only customizing our messages, but we're in the subscription game, we're doing memberships, we are, you know, where we're directly creating re- uh, unique relationships with customers. That customization is critical. And then obviously increasing our use of things like technology like AI, which, you know, we're just really at the beginning of that process, but, uh, you know, feeling like I need to go back to school on some of that stuff. And it is amazing from what you said, again, the speed at which it's happening, people are doing it. And so you can't not be doing it, but there's still, pieces to kind of learn. There's connectors that you need sometimes to better understand how it is. We were having a a conversation the other day with um, a gym group that we work with. And one of our data partners was just talking to us about your, your swipe card. And so an opportunity for us to be able to figure out when is somebody at that point where they're just about ready to stop going to the gym. They used to come three times a week and then it drops to two and then suddenly it drops to one. And can we use that data in a way that still protects their privacy to some extent, but also has a chance for us to be able to say, Hey, what's what's going on? How can we help? You know, and if we can't, that's okay too. But that to me is to your point, that's kind of one of the most interesting things. And how does, how do we protect that data? How do we make sure the consumers still feel like they own their data? And as brands, how are we cognizant of that in ways that hopefully becomes helpful and not too, in, too intrusive? To yeah. Look, extent? I think the privacy issue is a, is a massive Ooh, one, but it's coming, but I actually think, um, like in many cases in regulatory situations, they actually create very unique opportunity. Sure. My belief is that the privacy elements actually put an incredible requirement on us as as brands 
to create value for the customer. Because the vast majority of the privacy elements can be overcome if by you're providing a, value. If, if you provide value and allow that customer reason to want to sign in. Yep. Um, if you have a rationale for why the first party data will provide them value in return. We'll all do it. We'll all do it. We're already doing it in every day in terms of our phones and other things that, that yep. are that are critical. So in a way, I love it because I think it forces us to step back and say, okay, what is that value we're going to provide for our, for our customer in a way? And it holds us to a place where if we don't, the stakes are pretty high. You, yeah. know, you wake up without that, that first party data a little bit from now, it's not going to be a very pleasant place to, to, to work. Tariq Hassan, Chief Marketing Officer for Petco. I greatly appreciate you making time for us this season. I told you it would be painless uh, other than your cab ride over here. I hope that it was. <laughs> uh, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show and getting a chance to kind of uh, talk through some things with you. We hope that you'll allow us to continue to reach back out. We love having some of our uh, guests that we didn't get to cover everything that we wanted to back on from time to time. And you're certainly one of those people. There's a you know there's a handful of those that we see a lot. You're at events. You're constantly kind of evolving yourself. And by showing that to all of us that are in the industry, you allow us to sometimes evolve through through you. And we appreciate that. Hey, it's a real pleasure and an honor to join you guys. Thanks so much for the opportunity. This is, uh, again, this is the first episode of season four to kick off the show. We were super excited to have you on the show and uh, let's take us out. Uh, we decided to come back out. We decided to utilize some of the great content that we had, but also give some of our guests the chance to be able to talk a little bit about kind of what's happened really in such a short amount of time, how much maybe has changed. So with me right now is a Tarek Hassan. Tarek, how did I do in the pronunciation? Perfect. Nice job, Sean. How has it impacted you specifically? There's, you know, all of us have been impacted in some way or another, right? Whether it's friends, colleagues, um, the implications of our jobs individually or, or our jobs collectively, right? And none of us have been spared from that. And look, I, I remain pretty optimistic and, and you know, the I say, you know, let's say my team a fair bit, you know, pandemic is the new mother of invention. And so how do we use this as an opportunity to, um, both reaffirm our mission and our purpose of what we've done and what we do. Um, and, and it has, but also, you know, how does that become a motivation for doing things that might've taken us six months to a year and we're finding ways to get them done, you know, by the day or the week. Right. And so it's been a pretty, um, trying time for all of us. It's been opportunities for to reflect on the things that are important and be grateful of, because as you say, there's the, you know, the challenges of, of really the sadness that happens with this. Um, but also I think it's reminded us uh, just how important this human connection actually is and, and our relationships actually are. And so, you know, again, to dovetail off of that a little bit, one of the interesting things that you said in the, in the episode that just, um, that just was prior to this was the fact that Petco itself, you know, really that you're often there for people in times of crisis and a lot of us that are pet parents that are out there turn to those that we trust. And so how have you guys helped navigate this uh, as a brand uh, in, in what the world is out there today? Yeah, look, it's been pretty fascinating times. And as I'm sure you've heard from so many of our colleagues and friends, you know, there's no, uh, no roadmap on this one. There's no playbook uh, to draw on it. For us, it, it fell into a couple of chapters. Um, the first and the foremost important one is our people, right? So you've got 1,500 locations, you've got over 20,000 employees, uh, both between your headquarters and your stores. How do you keep everybody safe? How do you stay appraised to what is an environment that was constantly changing and not really understanding what would be next, let alone what safe looked like um, and what the rules were? So really, it was getting our head around that, putting some pretty significant processes in place and making sure that, you know, at least with the information we had, um, we were moving quickly to understand how to keep our folks safe. And, and that started even locally working with, uh, you know, with uh, UCSD, University of California, San Diego, and working with a professor from there to help us get educated and really understand what we could about this virus and the impact and make sure we were really putting some science as it was as the science community was still bringing it together. And then the second objective was, you know, how do we stay open? Um, because initially, um, and those in the retail space are, they are all going through these challenges. This is not a common national law, right? This is state by state, sometimes county by county. Um, and we, had, you know, you'd be surprised how we had to kind of remind some government officials, we are the grocery store for, you know, for your hamster pets. and for your pets. Yeah. You know, we are the doctor's office uh, for your cats and your dogs. Um, and we are um, the groomers for these pets. And by the way, grooming is not just this sort of beauty salon thing. There are health aspects to 
keeping your pet uh, safe and healthy um, and infection implications that can happen if, if not groomed and bathed properly. So the first step was how do you, you know, how do you stay open, which thankfully we've been able to do. And then from a marketing standpoint, how do you think moving forward again, just as you said, there's no roadmap. Yeah. So as we kind of wrap with that question, how do you feel like this will change the brand itself? Is Is, is there a change or is it that through this, you've been able to, again, just better understand what's really most important, which were many of those philosophies that you guys had already believed and, and agreed in, and it's a continuation of that, or is there any additional evolution that you feel like may come from this? Well, I'll tell you, um, I've never been more proud of the organization and the steps we've taken in the in the year leading up to this, year and a half leading up to this, because really establishing our, our, our purpose and really redefining ourselves even as far back a year ago when we took the steps we did on nutrition and took a step towards being a health and wellness company for pets. Um, trying to develop that purpose now would be really challenging. Having it in place and having people aware of it has been an absolute powerful uh, connect for us with our, with our pet parents. Um, and it's allowed us to stay true to who we are, but in many ways it's been an accelerator to the many things that we have in, envisioned. And some of the things you and I talked about last time I was on the show um, are, are playing out really critical for us. But the, again, the first steps we had to take were, it's one thing to be open. It's another thing to be open, safe, and healthy, not only for our employees, but for our customers and helping them understand what that looks like. Um, and so, boy, and there again, no set answer, right? Depending on where you are. So in hotter markets, like a, like a, like a New York, where the numbers were significant, it ranged from changing business models from everything to what we were calling a deli style takeout. Um, you know, one customer at a time to a cash register, hand your order. We send runners back into the store to bring it to you and, and out the door you go in order to sort of maintain real significant distance. Um, we in stood other, up other markets. You had more room to work. Uh, other markets. We, you know, social distancing and trying to establish as best as we could what we'd learned from the CDC and, and opportunities to make changes. And then we did things like standing up curbside, um, you know, delivery where, you know, you're doing buy in store, pick up online and we do, we do court curbside uh, out to you. You use the word acceleration. I want to kind of end with that to some extent. Yeah. I think this has accelerated so much for so many people. Look at how we're doing this right now, right? We're, I, I yeah. so much prefer to do the podcast from in a studio where you're sitting with a guest. It's such a, a different experience, but you adapt around it. You move around it. I think one of the most interesting things for us to watch will be how this accelerates media specifically and the purchasing of media out there in the marketplace, because you had OTT out there for many brands and they kind of were doing some of that along with some of their traditional and that yeah. stuff. But certainly this acceleration is going to do nothing but probably propel that even more forward how we all interact with brands and 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 media specifically yeah and for us that acceleration has been as you could imagine real fast acceleration into our into our e-com and digital business um which has just as you can imagine gone absolutely insane but that's been a good thing for us it's been a forcing function for us to do the kind of things we need to do to drive it so our performance media uh, investments are really significant and then the role we play in content and the content that we're doing is very different. It's very health and wellness based. It is providing information. You know, we're getting questions from our customers all the time about how to think about the virus in terms of, of their animals. And so, you know, you, you got to help people understand really what the distinction is between how the disease carries to a pet and what we do know. Um, there is no proof that the pets transmit. There is some proof that humans transmit to pet. Um, and so... Um, we, you know, helping customers work their way through that, but do it with authority, right? So we've had our vets engaged and we're really uh, making sure we're there for our partner parents. You guys were lucky that you were always already again, forward thinking, especially when it comes yeah. to, uh, to content. So, well, listen, I appreciate you taking some time uh, out of your day. Uh, Tarek Hassan, CMO for Petco. Thanks for making time for us. Hopefully next time I'm back in the city, you'll, uh, you'll let me catch up with you as well. You stay uh, healthy and well, be good to you, you and your brothers. All right. Be well. Thank you very much. Thanks for hanging out in the CMO suite. The podcast for marketers who want to be in the know. Presented by Connectivity Holdings. You're a C-level manager. You shouldn't have to know the difference between behavioral or contextual targeting. But your agency should. UConnex provides brands and biddable teams direct access to platforms like the Trade Desk, Google, Amazon, Facebook, OTT, and more. Their U.S.-based traders can train your in-house team or provide complete transparency with no minimums and CPM-based service pricing for true transparency, something Mighty Hive, The Trade Desk, and Centro simply don't offer. Tired of being the smartest one in the room? Reach out to UConnects today for a free demo. UConnects, the world's leader in true, transparent, biddable media.